Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, Episode 8. Can you hear me now? Coming to you from Hamilton, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Mo T. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your game and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of game playing, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone hanging out in the lobby here on Twitch. It's a pleasure to see people interested. For those listening to the podcast, you can join us live every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern at twitch.tv slash tabletopbellhop. Audience feedback. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week, we hope to highlight some of that feedback, both positive and negative. We got a lot of feedback on the tech at the table topic. I'm not going to go over all of it. That would probably take the whole show. But here are some highlights. Tommy Brownell. I mean, I won't buy games that require apps to play. My smartphone is a company smartphone, so the most I'll use it for at the game table is hunting up answers for rules, questions online, and snapping the occasional picture to share on Facebook or G+. Got to admit, those are good uses of a company phone. Tommy makes a good point, though. One of the problems with the growing number of games that require apps is that those apps need something to run on. Not everyone has a cell phone. For years, I did not have a cell phone. Everyone else was going on, I think, by the time I got into it, like iOS 9 or whatever was out. I was one of those people. And I now that I have a cell phone, often forget that not everyone does. So I do admit, I don't like the fact that app-based games creates haves and have-nots, right? Like, there's people out there that will never be able to play the XCOM board game. That does kind of suck. But then again, gaming's a luxury as it is. So is having a cell phone. And there's plenty of non-app-based games out there people can play. Phil Hatfield on G Plus noted quite a few things. This is condensed from his original quotes. I'm very much torn on technology at the table. I played some app-assisted games, and I can see some benefits. To those in for those in some instances. I snap pictures of games I play, but that's pretty much all I use my phone for. However, I've seen the negative aspects. The, hey, look at this funny video that inevitably comes up when someone isn't paying enough attention to the game and decides they want to watch YouTube or something and sees a funny video and then distracts everyone else from the game as well. I've seen people get into lengthy text chats and have seen the effects such things do to the player's demeanor that can often ruin the game. Distractions are big problems for some people. For his personal experience, he notes that there have been more negative experiences with technology at the table than there have been positive. So the exact opposite of the point I was trying to make the last episode. Well, thanks, Phil. And I think you really nailed it in your comment when you mentioned someone isn't paying enough attention. That really sums up most of these complaints that I'm hearing about technology, which are really, they're to involve technology, but they're actually in many ways personal problems where yes. a person has a problem with technology. The technology isn't necessarily the problem, but the technology is an enabling factor, and, I, and I'm willing to grant that. Mm -hmm. uh, Jeb Boyt on G Plus writes, two more examples applicable to role-playing. Texting is an excellent way of passing notes for the GM to provide character-specific information. Ironically, my group that makes the best use of it is otherwise Luddites. <laughs> Private Facebook groups are great for both role-playing and table talk groups. I'm a member of groups for a Twilight Imperium League, a group for All Quiet on the Martian Front, and a statewide historical miniatures group. Facebook is constantly suggesting other groups to me. Now, those are a couple great uses for tech that we did miss in our episode. I organize a wide variety of local gaming events through the Windsor Gaming Resource Facebook group, as well as using Messenger for organizing my Monday and Friday night rooms. Sorry, game nights. There are, uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I also like the idea of using it to pass notes. It's not something I've used before, but definitely a lot easier than, uh, and less obvious than the whole slip in the DM, the note under the table. Elizabeth Nugent on G+. Depends on the tech, really. Grab your phone to Chwazi first player? Awesome. Grab your phone to play Solitaire where your opponent plans their next move? Maybe. Okay. In a two-player game, but not when there's something sitting right there that you could talk to instead. Someone sitting right there. Sorry, something would be a little more insulting or there's AI involved. So not when there's someone sitting right there you could talk to. Play a different game on your phone? throw everyone else's moves and then ask, uh, wait, what happened? Every time it comes around to you, I won't be playing with you again. 
Thanks, Elizabeth. That's always a problem. You need to, again, you need to balance it, and you need to make a personal choice when it's appropriate and when it isn't. Coleman Gonzalez on Facebook has some more positive use of texting during games. Texting other players is extremely appropriate for secret nego negotiation games, like a Game of Thrones, a board game, Rex, or Diplomacy. Excellent. Great uses for texting. I think we have to start texting more during our games. Thanks, Coleman. Yesterday on Discord, I got one more piece of software recommended. This comes from Lucky Chucky on the RPG Talk Discord server. He suggested Infinitus DM for both maps and organizing your campaigns. Now, I took a quick look at it, and it looks great for running RPG games online. It's system agnostic, too, which is a big bonus. So I'm going to read this out quick. It's HTTP www.infinitasdm.com, infinitasdm.com. You'll also be able to see that in the show notes if you subscribe to the podcast or over on the blog when this episode goes live. Well, thanks, Chucky. We get better with your comments and suggestions, and if you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last here. What games hit the Bellhop's tabletop? Maybe due to QCC. Sorry, I skipped the whole section. <laughs> <laughs> Every week, I like to take a look back at the games we played and the events we attended and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of hashtag what did you play Mondays every week at tabletopbellhop.com. Now maybe it's due to Queen City Conquest, but it because it's been months since any RPGs hit my table locally, possibly like close to years. And went to QCC, played six games there. Uh, Listen to our special episode. You can hear all about them. Uh, but I don't know. I'm, I'm like in the RPG mood, I guess, because I played two more this week. We also played some great games at the, the local game store, including uh, getting an expansion for a game off my pile of shame. And yes, we finally started Gloomhaven. Well, QCC was certainly inspirational, and I'm sure building that Gloomhaven insert <laughs> helped get that game on the table. It did. After all that work, I definitely wasn't going to wait until uh, to get it, <laughs> wait too long to get it to the table. Tonight is the night I can't put words out the mouth in the order they should be. I'm going to be using a jigsaw puzzle to build our audio for this, aren't I? <laughs> so Monday night, the unthinkable happened. Like my group, the attendant, they have a Monday night group, right? And we're all adults and attendance is terrible. I don't have a problem with this, right? We all have lives. I get it. I don't blame them. Um, our, our attendance has been so bad that there was, we had a game night at the CG realm the other day and an old friend, Jamie happened to show up just to do some shopping. He wasn't there for the gaming event. And while he was there, he noted that his group has fallen apart, that, you know, people have gone their separate ways. I guess one of his gamers went and became a farmer now, and he's a, I don't know, he took he decided to LARP Catan. So Jamie's group broke up, and the attendance at my game nights on Mondays have been terrible. So I'm like, Jamie, why don't you come back? Come game with us again. And he's like, yeah, that'd be cool. And about three weeks have gone by since then, and of course, no Jamie. And we had two, three players, and like, you hear about it every Monday, what we played. It's usually smaller player count games. Well, this Monday, everyone showed up, like all six of my regular group and Jamie. So all of a sudden I had seven players. Like it was the start of the launch party where we're like, wow, we have seven people here. What can we all do together? Well, there are worse things than having too many players around, but it does impact what games you can play, especially if you only want to have one table running and not have separate groups. Yeah, that was actually something I tried to push, but they weren't having it. I'm like, we could split into a group of three and four, and uh, that didn't go so good. Now, I do have some good seven-player games between two cities, Seven Wonders, Pitch Car. It just, I don't know. I didn't really want to play any of those, especially with this particular group. We're more into the adventure games or trying new stuff out. It's also a group of players I can play heavier stuff with. I just wasn't looking for the light one-hour games. But... This is the group that was originally formed to play RPGs. Like, this was supposed to be a role-playing group. I ran a three-year Warhammer Fantasy role-play third edition campaign with these guys. Jamie played in my fourth edition game that was the game we played before Warhammer. So this is really what my kids called the role-playing friends. We're all there. So I decided to take advantage of having everyone there. 
So I grabbed Mouse Guard, the RPG. This is a fantastic game based on the David Peterson comics, which if you haven't read Mouse Guard, you really should read Mouse Guard. It is a fantastic series of comics put out by Archaea Press. Uh, David Peterson does the writing and the art himself. And it's a medieval society of mice. And the guard are the protectors, the the watchers, the people who reestablish scent trails. It's a very uh, high adventure. But the cool part is they're about as strong as mice. Like, yes, they have little swords and, and shields and they all wear capes. But like a crow is a horrible like Godzilla attacking, right? Like it's... You're, there's still most level of power and they tend to be fighting against the weasels. Actually, the comics are set just after the last weasel war. Fantastic comics, strongly recommended. So I picked up the RPG. Uh, there's two printings of it. I got the second printing. It is probably one of the most interesting RPG systems I've read because Luke Crane, the author, thinks he's smarter than you. And I got to admit, he might be, but his way of presenting his rules is almost pedantic and insulting. So I didn't touch the game for a bit. But you know what? What we did is we made characters for the game. So this way, all seven people have characters. Because one of the things in Mouse Guard is you tend to play a guard patrol, which is either three or four mice. So this way, out of those seven players, if only three show up, I can run Mouse Guard. If only four show up, I can run Mouse Guard. So we did that. We made that. I'll probably talk, or I hope. I'll talk more about the game if we actually start playing more. But now that everyone has characters, that should be able to happen more often. That's great. And I've heard this one call, uh, referred to a number of times. And every time it is, I think of Mouse Hunt, the old Facebook game years ago where you had to collect different kinds of cheese and uh, all sorts I of... I played that. And it was like a farming game. Everyone, everyone on Facebook. You, and then years ago, back when, when uh, you know... Before, before all the other little uh, matching games and things that came up, everyone played Mouse Hunt. Uh, and it I, disappeared. But I remember different types of cheese yeah. and going on quests. Yeah, 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 yeah. and you had to build, yeah. you had to get certain types of cheese to build things. It was, uh, yeah, it always remembers remember me of that. I, this is cooler than Mouse Hunt. <laughs> So once everyone, like we made these characters, right? It, everyone was kind of in an RPG kind of mood at this point, like trying to break out a board game at this point would have been fruitless. And then I remembered something from QCC. I played Rocker Boys and Vending Machines, Phil Vecchione's Cyberpunk Love Letter game. Again, if you want more info on that, listen to our QCC special episode. I think I talk about it quite a bit. That was such a great game. And one of the cool things is, is it's a free RPG and it's one page, two sides. Well, after playing Phil's game, we got to take home a copy of the game because that was basically our character sheet. We had circled stuff on the sheet. So I'm like, oh, what the heck? Let's see if I can run Rocker Boys and Vending Machines. And you know there a game has some real staying power when you play it once at a con and the next time you sit down at a table, you try to play it again. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's true. <laughs> it's a good sign. Well, plus, I fear it'd be good for a, a, a large group, right? Uh, it's not a lot of RPGs that work good with six players. So everyone made characters. Like this character generation in this game is really simple. You take that one sheet of paper and basically you circle stuff on it. Now, I didn't pre-plan this. So going back to our teaching episode, I didn't do the prep. I should have done ahead of time and printed off copies of the rules for everyone. So we just passed the sheet around which worked. So it's stuff like you pick your look, like one of the looks is chrome or leather or shiny or corporate. And you just circle one of those and that's your look. And then you get to um, your, I don't remember what they call it, your, your character class, your archetype. I, I can't remember what they actually call it in the game. And you got drivers and couriers and the street samurai. And all, again, all the cyberpunk things. So you go through and you pick a bunch of things. You pick what your cyberware is, what's wrong with your cyberware, and then you set your stat. The interesting thing in this game is there's one stat in this game, and it's rated from two to five. And I talked about this more in the QCC thing, but just to summarize quick for people who haven't heard that episode, you have, two, you have one number which represents a scale from two to five in either rock or machine. And when you go to do something, if you're doing it with a whole bunch of... Um, bravado or personality or your heart you're using rock whereas if you're trying to hack or fire a gun or drive a car you're using machine and when you're trying to roll machine you roll under your number if you're trying to roll rock you roll over your number really extremely simple system and it worked really well with six people because it is that simple we had lots of laughs 
my friend Jamie, who I mentioned earlier, was this leather clad rocker boy who just kept showing up. Like at one point they stole a key card and he had to text everyone in the group, ah, got the key card. Like it was pretty amusing. It was good stuff. Lots of stuff. Uh, the group was betrayed by the courier cyber arm, turned on the entire group. The driver mixed up the fireworks and the explosives. They had to fight a rival gang. It was a fantastic game. I highly recommend checking out Rocker Boys and Vending Machine. And like I mentioned on the other site earlier, if you check the show notes or check the blog, there's a link to it. Plus, just if you Google Rocker Boys and Vending Machines, I'm sure it'll come up. The mood and the setting of this game are so strong. With a good group, I can't believe it. you can have a bad time with such a simple mechanic staying out of your way. Yeah, the only thing it needs is it needs a DM that can improvise. So on the DM side of things, there's, uh, I think it's four. There's three or four charts, and you roll 1d6 on each of them. So it's like, what's the setting? Uh, what's the job? Because the whole point is you're doing a job. Uh, what's the job? What's the complication? Like, what gets in the way, and what's the twist? So, like, we rolled, it was an arcology, or I rolled, an arcology, um, blow something up, a rival cyber gang, and then the twist I actually didn't use because the game went a little late, but it was supposed to be when they got there, it wasn't there. Whatever they went to blow up wasn't supposed to be there. I'd skip that part of it, but that's it. So, like, if you know the cyberpunk genre really well and you're good at DMing and you've DMed lots of games, it's not that bad. But, like, for someone who's new to RPGs, getting handed that and saying, okay, run an adventure for six people is not going to be too easy. So chronologically, Gloomhaven was next, but I'm going to save that for last. So what I'm going to do is jump to Sunday because I want to stick with RPGs since we're in that section right now. So my oldest daughter, we'll call her Big G, ran her first ever RPG, which I think is fantastic. With my kids, I didn't want to force them into gaming. I wanted them to come to me and them be genuinely interested. I didn't want to be one of those parents that I'm like, you must like the things I like. I see that too often, and I have not close friends, but people I interact with on the internet who are like, oh, I tried to get my kids into D&D at age six, and it failed, and now they won't game with me ever again. I didn't want to make that mistake, right? So I, it, it's just something where we just did it, and like I said, the kids called Monday Night Group my RPG friends. Eventually, over the years, they were, I think, four and six maybe a little older than that, they came to me like, we want to try an RPG. So I picked up a game called Mermaid Adventures. Fantastic kids system by uh, Eloy LaSanta. Hey, I happen to have a copy right here for those of you in the video. For those listening at home, I'm holding up a copy of Mermaid Adventures. It's a cute game where the kids make mermaids. It's not as simple as Rocker Boys and Vending Machines, but you don't need to know any tropes to play it, right? Everyone knows mermaids. Uh, it's just a D6-based system. There's white dice are good, black dice are bad. You roll them, you're looking for, I, I think it's numbers over three. Really simple, really basic game. The kids had the most fun making characters in it because it's a life pass system where they just roll on this like, oh, I'm this kind of mermaid. Oh, I have purple hair. Oh, I have a seashell as my favorite thing. They loved it. But it's really simple. And when we finished, I ran it for them. I tried to get, so I'm running it. And I'm like, BG, you got to try it. You, you want to read this book? And she's all excited. She's like, yeah, yeah, I want to read it. And she read it. And then I'm like, okay, you're going to run a game? She's like, no. And I'm like, why not? She said, nah. And like that went on for a while. I kept trying to push her to run the game and she just was never interested. Eventually I got her to admit it's because it was daddy's game. I don't know. Like just something, you know, way kids think that was my game. I run that game. So this, this year for Christmas, this past year that went by, I bought her Tales of Equestria. Now, this is the My Little Pony role-playing game. It's an officially licensed, all the actual characters, and gave that to her for Christmas. I bought the Monster Manual, whatever it's called for that. Looked like a decent enough system. Looked like it was a little heavier than Mermaid Adventures, but still pretty good. So I gave that to her, and she was excited Christmas morning, but there was lots of other toys and everything. And then I just never heard about it again. Again, I wasn't going to push, right? I'd, I'd bench every now, oh, did you ever read those books? Yeah, yeah, I read them. Like months went by. And then one day we're sitting here, I, I was on the computer and she comes downstairs and she's got the book in her hands, like holding it like this. And there had to be 80 rainbow colored sticky notes sticking out of the top of it, all different sections. And like, you can see, they say like equipment, traits, the stats, dice, whatever. 
if you go on the blog and you look up the what did you play this week for September 17th, whatever Monday was, you can see the picture. I put it up on there and like here she is because I had to grab a camera and take a picture of this because this book looked hilarious. And she was like, I got to play. I got to play. So I finally got to play Sunday. Uh, you know what? It's fantastic when the kids are interested and they develop their own interest. Uh, yeah. for, I, as, as a as a as a gamer, that's as proud a parenting moment as any sports ball winning event. <laughs> True enough. So we sat down Sunday. The first thing we do is make characters. It's simple. You pick either a unicorn, a pegasus, or a normal pony. That sets your stats, which are body, mind, and charm. You pick one of the elements of harmony, which I know is a big part of the, the cartoon and the story. You get one talent and one quirk, and those are rated at a die, like D6 or something. So I made a character. His name was Flash. His element of his element of harmony was loyalty. My quirk was the stare. My pony mark, or whatever they call it. Pony mark doesn't sound right. Cutie mark, that's it. Cutie mark was like an eyeball, which creeped my kids out. They're like, Dad drew a creepy eye. And I'm like, oh, I was trying to be trying to be cute. Speaking of drawing, that was like the most important thing to Big and Little G was us drawing our ponies. Uh, that was an important part of character creation. So I drew mine first. And I shared a picture online of, of my pony. But then I had to redraw it because I guess I forgot to draw the equipment. And you don't have the equipment unless you draw it on your pony. Now, I have no clue if this is in the rule book or this was Big G. I don't know. So aside from the drawing portion, which is easier? Making characters in Rocker Boys or in Tales of Equestria? Uh, it's it's Rocker Boys, because really you're just circling things on a list. You don't have to think. But really, this isn't hard. Like, this was... Well, I, I didn't have the book, so this is learning from my daughter. Was just pick this, and she'd tell us something. Actually, it was about the same, I guess, because pick this. But then when you got the talents, like, there was, like, four or five pages of talents, and she wanted to read them to us, and we're like, no, no, don't read it. Just pass the book. And she's like, no, but it's the DM book. I'm like, no, no, just pass the book around. We'll read through it ourselves. Cause, and then it's flipped through. And then there was the talents and the quirks was the same thing. It was like a couple pages of quirks. So, yeah, with, with having to read all that compared to a one sheet circling something like flashy, it's a little different. So then we play part of an adventure. So the, the adventure that... I had no idea quite what to expect, like if there'd be dungeon crawls or what. Like the cover definitely lends itself to look like you're going to be doing D&D &D type things. But I'm sure that's just so that the game appeals to not just My Little Pony fans. But it was very much a My Little Pony adventure. So what it was is the regular ponies had something important to go do somewhere far away and dangerous. And we had to watch their pets when they were gone. So... That works. It was cute. I don't want to spoil it because I know this is the adventure in the book and I'm sure people may play it. Uh, the actual system was different dice for different stats. Roll those to beat a target number. So kind of like Savage Worlds. So in Savage Worlds, if you're bad at something, you have a D4 in the stat. If you're really good, you have a D10. In this, we had D6s and D8s were the only two numbers we saw, but I guess there are other numbers. And they had a system that was called Exploding Hoof which was if you rolled the max number on the die, you rolled again and added it, which I said to her, I'm like, exploding hoof sounds like a really bad thing to happen to a pony, but whatever. So that, that reminded me of Savage Worlds, which was cool, nice and simple system. And then they had friendship tokens, which were cool. Like now Sean's played Fate, so kind of like Fate Points, same idea. So it was spend one to add plus one to one of your die rolls, spend two to re-roll, or spend three to just pass. So I'm like, okay, that's kind of cool. Somehow there was a way to get them back. At one point, Big G handed Little G a uh, uh, friendship token. I don't remember why. So there was some kind of system for that. I, she used pennies, which I thought was cute. She, we all had little piles of pennies. So the adventure ended on a cliffhanger. Everyone had fun. We had lots of laughs. Man, I don't think I've seen both my kids laugh that much at the table together in a long time. That was good. There was literally no fighting. Um, I'm looking forward to our next session, maybe this Sunday. Well, it sounds like you've got a burgeoning uh, GM on your hands. Now, what I want to know is, will there be an official handover of dice at some point, uh, handing the reins down? No, no. <laughs> we we took Big G to the local game store and let her pick out and buy her own dice. So that has officially happened. We haven't done it with Little G yet. 
But no, that was an important trip. Deanna was like, just give her a set of dice. I'm like, no, no, no. She's got to pick out her own. Yeah. They're kind of pink and sparkly. It pretty much fits. There you go. So now over to board games. Saturday, D and I went to Brimstone game night. She got in a game of Disney Villainous. This one's hot. People are talking all about this game. All I know about it is you play the villains from Disney movies. What D's opinion of it was, D being Anchi Games, our chat moderator and my wife, was that it was interesting. It was very asymmetric where every player had a different goal to win and you were all trying to do it at the same time. But the important one that I heard was we don't need to own this. All right, where was I? Board games, Brimstone. He played Villainous. All right, while she was playing Villainous, I broke out a game called CV. Uh, this is, I'm going to forget the, how it's the Latin name for um, a resume. It's what all the British people call them, curriculum vitae or something like that. Basically means resume. This, excuse me. And with it, I grabbed gossip, CV gossip, an expansion. Grabbed that from the pile of shame. So CV is a game, I call it the game of life Yahtzee. So you're using dice to buy cards to build a tableau. But the whole point is you're telling someone's life story. So you start off and you draft some cards for your childhood. And it's stuff like um, your parents bought you life insurance. You have a bike. Um, got bullied at school. Or I only you got an A on your report card. I can't remember. It's a bunch of starting cards that go in your hand. And then you start off into teenage years and early adulthood. And you roll the dice, and based on the symbols on the dice, you buy cards. And when you put the cards in front of you, thematically, they represent a moment in your life. So there's activities, there's education, and then there's social events, I guess we'll call them. Lastly, there's a type of card that is all just stuff, and you get points for accumulating stuff. Because, well, it's a commercial society, I guess, even in CV. So... The way it works is when you buy these cards, they then modify the dice or give you bonus symbols. And basically, it's an engine building game. So the more cards you have in front of you, the more options you're going to have to buy more cards. Everyone's buying cards. It's a solid game. But the fun of this game is the stories you tell. So it's stuff like sitting there and the guy, someone we were playing with that weekend started off. And the first thing they got was that they were a slacker. The next thing they got was job at dad's company. And then the next thing they did was traveled the world and then they started blogging and then eventually they became the CEO because obviously dad must have died. Like, and it's the stories you tell while playing the game that make it so good. It is rather fun, like solid engine building game with if right players telling stories as they go. And it's the kind of thing where if you've got the right group of gamers, as soon as you put the card down, everyone at the table speculating what that card meant or going, Oh yeah, of course you then went and joined the circus. That makes perfect sense. Or what, what the heck? Why did your guy suddenly get a PhD? It must've been an honorary degree or something, right? Like that's half the fun of the game. So what I added to it though, was called CV gossip. This is an expansion for CV that I have owned for almost a year and I just never got off the pile of shame. Grabbed it this night, got it off the pile of shame. Pile of shame going down is good. Uh, this adds two types of cards. There are, what is it? Fortune and rumors. What these do is the rumors are bad cards. They're they're nasty things people are saying about your character that may or not, or I'm saying character, see, role players playing a game where you build life, immediately think it's a character. So they're saying nasty things about this resume that you're building so when you get those instead of keeping them for yourself you put them in someone else's cv so it's it makes it more of a take that game which actually the original game didn't have a lot of interaction except for telling those stories together this adds a nice level of player interaction that was missing from the game then the fortune cards so two of the symbols on the dice are luck luck or happiness and bad luck or misfortune and when you roll three luck cards, you get to pick a card for free. But when you roll three on happiness, something bad happened in your life and you have to erase something off your CV, which can be devastating in the original game, especially if you roll them two or three times in a row. So one of my friends noted that his girlfriend will never play the game again because the first time she played, she rolled unha three unhappy faces her first three rolls and was just like, this game's not for me. So what these fortune cards do is they help mitigate that. The fortune cards are only built, bought with happiness and unhappiness. Now, they're generally not good cards, but they're 
way better than losing a card out of your CV. So it was a neat way to mitigate some of the random factors that come up in the game. So what's really cool is I already like the game a lot. Gossip made it significantly better, which you're taking a good game and putting it even higher, which is great. So I literally there at the shop threw out the box for Gossip, mixed the cards in with the rest, and I'll never play CV without using Gossip at this point. There's no reason to. Oh, that sounds interesting. And I'm thinking in the timeline, this would have been about the time I was tagging you on Facebook because people were pushing to go buy Azul because they play it so much. Yeah. You can buy it. They're sold out. No. They are sold out everywhere in Windsor and Essex County right now, which is not unusual. Azul is hard to keep in stock. It is that. I thought it was funny, though. You're like, blah, 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 Brimstone. I'm like, yeah, Brimstone. Who are we talking about? I, I had a pretty good idea you were. you were. They had just gotten home with their brand new game that wasn't Azul. So I was scolding them, and they, uh, and they mentioned, but we couldn't buy it. We tried. So. Should have sent them over. They could have said hi. Could have <laughs> taught them how to play whatever they bought. <laughs> so then D rejoined us, and we played that is the wrong game i typoed let's try it again he rejoined us and we played terraforming mars this i've talked about it before i'm not going to get into all the details of terraforming mars probably the best game in my collection right now same with terraforming mars there's a really easy way to play where everyone starts with resources beginner corporations and the game's pretty quick and then there's the full corporate wars it's called way to play which makes for a much better game but it's much longer well, we had a group of players who all know the game. All visuals are frozen, according to the chat. Interesting. That, that might just be a temporary thing, I hope, because everything's... Please let us know if it starts working again, and I will repeat myself again. What is up with Discord? We patched you like eight times this week. <laughs> everything's so I can't fine see on the our quality. Side. On our side, I'm everything's sure. fine. Like, I've, I've got, hey. I don't know why everything's frozen. Mm -hmm. Weird. Oh, we have quite a few people in the we room. We do, Hello. we do. People have been, have been uh, dribbling in. Um, now you're frozen in Discord as well. Weird. Uh, I am going to take a moment and stop the stream and restart it, maybe? Okay. Oh, she's behind, but oh well, let me... Okay. Stopping stream. Oh, not even stopping it. Uh, it's always a good picture, too, you know. It's not stopping. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it won't stop. We can't oh, okay, stop no. the stream. It stopped, it stopped. Oh, it uh, says offline. Yeah, okay, let me figure out. Uh, Isn't that going to screw it up when we try to share? It won't be ideal, but I have uh, the full recording. I haven't stopped recording it, so. Okay. Uh, let me check the stream. Output. Try that. Fly. Okay. Start streaming. Yes. All right. And we are streaming yet again. Uh... <laughs> Would they have been able to hear us? Yes, I see oh, we are live. Excellent. Okay. So in hopefully theory, they can hear us and everything's good. In theory, I can see us on the dashboard as live. So uh, everything sounds like it's good. I'm getting sound effects from something, and I don't know what. Um, weird. I hear you okay. both. Awesome. Key movement from me both. Yay! Yay! All right. So, D rejoined us. We played Terraforming Mars. I don't know when you guys lost what I was talking about. So, in Terraforming Mars, there's the simple version. 
beginner corporations, uh, starting resources, plays very quick. There's the Corporate Wars version, which is the full version of the game, which I think is significantly better and really the only way to play. The problem was at this point, we only had an hour and a half before the game store was going to close. So we decided to try to house rule it. So what we decided to do was use all the Corporate Wars rules. So we used the new corporations. We used the uh, increased um, patents. We used all those. But we started everyone with one production. It worked well enough. Uh, there were a couple corporations that seemed a little overpowered starting with one production, but it wasn't enough to ruin the game. We managed to finish in under an hour and a half, and our scores, I think, were within eight points of each other. So that is something I love about that game. Our games are always close. I love Terraforming Mars. It is a fantastic game. If only it were more portable, you'd probably be playing it in even more places, but it, it takes up a bit of space. Yeah, it's it's not a small game. Not at all. Plus uh, the amount of time. As though you can finish a game in half an hour. It's not often you have, you know, you go to dinner and you order food. You don't usually have that two hours to fit in a game of Terraforming Mars. Whereas you can probably fit in a couple games of Azul. Depends on the right restaurant. Some of them don't mind you hanging around as long as you're ordering. That's true. That is true. So onto the game I'm guessing everyone wants my opinion on since it's the number one game in the world right now. Yes, it's considered number one. It's, it's a big deal to be number one. And when I say number one in the world, I'm talking on BoardGameGeek.com. We probably have mentioned BoardGameGeek almost every episode. That is because it is the world's largest database of board game information all in one place. Not only can you find out about pretty much every game ever published, you can get people's opinions on them. You can download rule books. It, it is a fantastic resource that every hobby gamer eventually finds and either runs away and hides because the interface is horrible or takes the time to learn and is obsessed with and like freak out when it's down for a day because they can't check whatever the question of the day that day. So this is like where gamers, 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 like the, the, I don't want to, I don't want to sound gatekeeping here, not better gamers, more important gamers, but alpha gamers, people who take the hobby more seriously than the average person hang out. And this game is number one there. So it's a first among peers kind of thing. Like, yes, it's a bit of a popularity contest, but this is the hot game right now. Now, I'll get it right out in the open before I even talk about the game. I um, got to say, I don't know how this game got to be number one. Like, to me, number one should be playable by anyone. Like, Sean should be able to come down and we should be like, hey, let's play Azul is a better example. Or I can go to my mother-in-law's for Christmas dinner and, like, break out a game. Now, maybe, number one, on board Game Geek, maybe you want gamers. Okay, I'll give it that. Maybe not playing with my mother-in-law, though she does game. Uh, but I should be able to sit down with any group. Like, my Monday night group, I should be able to play with it. I should be able to bring it to the FLGS and play with them. I don't think this game is accessible enough to a wide number of groups. Well, I, from what I've seen about it, it's a very much, uh, it, it's very much a gamer's game. I mean, it's a dungeon crawl. It's and so anyone yeah. who has you know, enjoyed, you know, the old school RPGs, the Warhammer's, the D and D's, and that type, they're going to be into this game. They're going to love this game, and that's probably what's been been driving the board game ge yeah. geek ratings for the most part. Uh, now, I was wondering, did you get the first or the second printing? I ended up because of all the buzz from the first edition, like, like when that game came out, the world blew up. Right. And I'm pretty sure it hit number one on board game geek. When the first edition first got out to people, they sold out, right? Like there was a ton of hype. It's kind of like Azul. Uh, so what they did is it's a, it's, this is the, one of the most amazing things about this game is it's a brand new publisher and a brand new designer, never published anything before. So his only way to publish is through Kickstarter, right? He doesn't own a big company or publishing company. So what he did is he launched a second Kickstarter to do a second printing. That's when I jumped on because of the fact that jumped to number one. And I've played every game that's been number one, and they're all good in their own ways. They're not all my favorite games, but they are good games. So I had to do it, right? I, I backed. I went all in. So I have the second printing, which, as far as I can tell, the only real difference I could see was you mark XP and health on, like, a dial as opposed to, like, on your character sheet. Oh, so they don't, have the, stick they don't have the stickers in the second printing? Oh, no. <laughs> there's definitely stickers. Stickers don't go on your character sheet. Well, who knows? Right now, all the stickers go on the map. Okay. I, it's neat. Like, I'll talk a bit more about the game. I don't know if we get into that. So, as for my opinion on the game, opening the box was fun. Building the insert is something I personally like. I like model kits. That was fun to do. Uh, but even more so, like, we didn't do research ahead of time. 
So like there's all these boxes with pictures on them and like little thin boxes. And then there's little cube kind of shaped boxes with the same pictures on them. I didn't know until I read the rules and opened it up that those are the possible character classes you can play. And the thin box is like your character sheet and your cards and stuff. And the square box is a miniature. So every character class is a miniature. Well, there's, I think, six. I may be wrong. I be to choose from a thing. And it tells you what they are in the rule book, but it doesn't tell you, like, their stats or anything. And I know a lot of people, when they start Gloomhaven, open all this stuff up and, like, pick a character. We're like, no, we're going straight off pictures. I'm like, I want the guy with the weird blocky thing that has a cool name. And then, like, cats, like, oh, I want the throwing star looking thing. Like, we totally had no clue what we were getting when we opened these boxes, which to me was a ton of fun. Right? Like, it's opening up. I'm like, oh, cool. I, I was the Craig Hart. So I'm like, I'm this Rocky dude. I look like a guy from Earth Dawn. That's awesome. And uh, Tori took the brute and he was this, like, giant, tall dude. And I, I don't even remember all the different characters. I know. And she games was basically a Skaven. She, she was a rat creature that feeds on necrotic flesh. So I don't know. Interesting character classes. Actually, big props. Side note, big props to Isaac Childress, who wrote the game, for not just sticking to the D&D tropes. Like, these aren't elves, dwarves. Like, there, there's some funky, cool races in here. So that was fun. Um, putting the map out and then reading the intro. Basically, it's like, you're not nice people. You're mercenaries. You are just trying to get money to get by, which is kind of a cool setting. You know, there's no forced you're a hero. Now, there's a hint of that is that there's a reputation track that goes from positive to negative, so it can go both ways. So I kind of knew that was coming. Uh, putting the map out was cool. Uh, the first mission, or sorry, reading the first adventure has you put your first sticker on the map. So that's where the stickers come in. Is Every time you unlock an adventure, you put an adventure site on the map, and then your map slowly fills in with like cool places to go. So ours has one little sticker on it. Setting up the mission was a bit annoying, even with the insert. Part of the problem is the insert I have does not have a way to sort the the tiles that you play on. So it's just a giant pile of tiles. So trying to find the proper appropriate ones was a bit annoying. Um, the overlays was pretty easy to do. It, it was okay. It, it's a bit of a pain setting up. And I think next time we have to organize things better, just like where things go, because there's like a deck for every monster. There's standees for all the monsters. We just kind of had to know where stuff went. But then we started trying to teach and play the game. And man, this is this is a learning curve, like a, a high learning curve. Well, it's, it sounds to me, we talk a lot in, about uh, different uh, deck management games and deck building games. This just seems like a game management game uh, where <laughs> in some ways, uh, at least until you get rolling, until you get a little deeper into the campaign, because I know it is a campaign game, uh, you're really sort of managing the game itself until until everyone is right up on board yeah like it's very asymmetric right so every character had their own deck of actions and every action card has two parts a top and a bottom and you start the game with your entire hand of level one card so my character had 11 cards to pick from and i'm trying to pick a top action on one and a bottom action on the other while not really knowing what everyone else has in their deck so it was it was a bit rough. And these were not simple. It was like not like move two and and attack for one. It was like put this card in play, and every time you would take a melee attack, move a counter one spot. Every time I'm, your thing moved off this spot, get an XP. And that's one card. And then my other card was like jump. And for every character you move over when you jump, they become paralyzed, which involved getting little chits and putting them out to mark who was paralyzed and then remembering who was paralyzed in later turns. Like it was rather complex. Like there were lots of icons. Like I would almost say Race for the Galaxy may be easier to rock than this. Like there, there may have been more icons. I don't know. It's, it's close. Now, I knew it wasn't easy to learn. Like, I had heard that complaint about the game ahead of time. But I it helped doing some research ahead of time on what people screwed up. But it still wasn't easy. And like, tracking status effects, the monster AI. The other part that really hurt was we failed hard. Like, so hard, I thought we played wrong. Like... I know lots of people do mistakes in that game. It's not an easy to learn game. There are a lot of little fiddly rules. So when we when we failed that bad, I was just like, oh, I wonder what we screwed up. We must have screwed up. So I thought I caught everything. No, I looked up three different FAQs. I went on Board Game Geek. I found this extensive Board Game Geek thread 
that had like every character class and every box with all spoilers. So you didn't have to see them unless you clicked on them. And we played everything right. We did nothing wrong. It's either the game was that hard or we have much more to learn about our individual characters and working together. Now I'm hoping that's it. I'm hoping it's a second one. Now, one of the things I did see in a lot of the FAQs was suggesting when you start a mission, you take the, you sum up all the character levels and divide it by two and then round up. And that's the level of adventure you're playing. Well, at level one, that works out to one. So you should be playing a level one adventure. Well, you can downgrade or upgrade the difficulty. And it seems like a lot of people are suggesting for the first couple missions to actually downgrade it. I just find that hard to do. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's interesting, and I've, I've read it. I, I read up on this one because I knew we were going to be talking about it. And and one of the major complaints I found about the game was that when you fail, you just fail, and you have to do it over, and you have to play the mission over yeah. again. There is no alternate path. I mean, you've got a hundred. That's correct. You've got a hundred uh, episodes uh, you can play essentially in this game, and if you have to redo every one, you fail without having an, an alternate timeline or an alternate path or some some change in the mechanic, I can see how that could be a little tedious uh, throughout the, the yeah. length of it. There is one thing, though, I don't know if this really improves it, but like right now we have one sticker on the map. The next time we play, we have a choice because we had to mark down where our location is. We can either do that again, or we can go back to Gloomhaven. If we go back to Gloomhaven, we can go shopping. Now, we didn't earn enough money to buy anything. We can have a city encounter which are generally positive, so that might give us some help. But then when we go back to the dungeon, we have to have a road encounter. And most of those are negative. So we could take a chance on that. But if we were further in the game, this part's kind of interesting, is you don't have to go back to the same dungeon. You can pick any sticker on the map. Right. So if you do fail later in the game and have a hard time, I think you can do the RPG thing where you're like, we'll return to that dungeon later. Yeah, you don't lose no. anything along the way, but you just Correct. you do eventually have to beat that adventure. Yeah, well, I'm assuming some may be completely side quests. I don't know. We're not that far in. So most of what I had to say was pretty negative. I, Yeah, I agree. I wasn't quite as good as I was expecting, but it's our first game. So the whole thing with this, though, is Gloomhaven is a role-playing game. It's D&D 3.5 level of complexity with no DM. That's impressive that they were able to create a game that feels like tactical D and D combat without a dungeon master still including things like I just mentioned, having encounters in the city and encounters on the road and having it work. I shouldn't expect it to be easy. Like if I think of running my first game of D and D 3.5 with all those combat rules, the one inch grid, the five foot steps and attacks of opportunity and plus two for this. And Oh my God. And the cover rules, like we fumbled around then. And I have a feeling we're just going through those growing pains again here. Now, the most positive thing, we're all looking forward to playing again this Friday. So if nothing else, we all still want to play. So I guess it must be worth it. That's a good sign. Uh, I know I know a lot of people were saying again on this one that it's not a put away game. Uh, even even when you even if you've gotten to the trouble and you've got that that great insert, a lot of people leave this one, uh, you know, find some table space for this one and leave it out. Uh, which makes coming back to it that that much more enjoyable, and you don't you know walking away from it, you don't have to dread putting it all away. Uh, another thing uh, that was suggested was this might actually be even more solid as a solo player game because you don't have that I, DM. You get all the all the advantage of an RPG without a DM, meaning your solo adventure can be strong. A little pricey maybe. for a solo game, maybe. But <laughs> well, yeah, just a bit. I don't know. I've always, you know, I'm supposed to be promoting uh, tabletop games, but, you know, for me, solo play means go play a video game. That's what I'd rather do. It's just not something that interests me. I'd rather, especially for the amount of work set up and everything, just for myself, I can go play Skyrim. That feels like an RPG too, right? I don't know. It's That's personal opinion. Not everyone right. likes all things. Yep. If you do like solo games, it's probably fantastic. Like, maybe that's the other thing. Maybe it plays best with three players, not four. But the fact that it's this ongoing campaign and it's a legacy game, right? Some of the things you do are going to impact later in the game. That, to me, is something that should be a shared experience with other people at the table. Now, a really cool thing in Gloomhaven that I don't know if I'm going to take advantage of that I didn't realize until I got it and read the rules was we could technically start a second party and use the same map. And I thought that was really neat. So I could technically break out the same game with my Monday night group 
they could open four new boxes of characters or even use the same ones we were playing, get their own set of equipment, and then go out and explore a, same, a different dungeon. Well, actually, at this case, they would do the same dungeon. Right. And one of the reasons I haven't done it yet is if we do that, then Tori and Kat are probably going to be pretty pissed that I beat that adventure <laughs> with my Monday night group. Right. But I'm thinking later in the game, when there's like eight different places to explore, it could be really cool to have two different parties exploring the map at once, or three or four. And I guess that's why, because I was a little confused having a legacy game like this, that people are bringing this to cons. Like I saw someone playing at Breakout Con and I was like, or not Breakout, sorry, QCC, one we were just at. And I was like, it's a campaign legacy. Why would you bring it? But no, they could bring it and they could even be continuing their own game with a different group every con they go to. And I'm like, that's kind of cool. Interesting. Well, on the podcast, believe it or not, we go through these games rather quickly. So we yeah, can save time a- for our main topic. To hear more of the Bellhop's thoughts on these games, check the On the Table section of tabletopbellhop.com. I got to admit, this episode, probably the uh, this part of the episode may be longer, but our topic, our, it's not that it's a bad topic, but it's a shorter topic and then say teaching games or tech at the table. So this, this may offset it. That's a bell. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room, the lobby. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. And we've got uh, Major Kayla in there tonight, as well as a few other people, but it's been a quiet uh, chat room tonight for the most part. So we have had some technical difficulties, which are probably keeping people a little more quiet. Yeah, I know a lot of people, too, like to put it on Twitch and then do other things, right? So they just have the audio going in the background. But I do invite anyone who is watching, please interact, please chat. We are watching it, and she games will be in there and talk to you. Plus, we will be checking back in later, and we can answer any questions you have and would love to hear your comments. Absolutely. So quick reminder for everyone who's not in our chat room right now, we now record on Wednesdays, not Thursdays. Join us twitch.tv slash tabletop bellhop every Wednesday at 9.30. You can now find us all across the web, and we grow by the support of listeners and viewers like you. So please take a minute to subscribe to our content on your favorite platform. Give us a like, comment, or review on YouTube, iTunes, Google Play, or wherever you find us, and help us spread our gaming advice to the world. That sounds slightly maniacal iTunes reviews in particular help people find the show and are greatly appreciated. I got to stop saying iTunes. I should be saying Apple podcast reviews since they rebranded. Uh, it still is the iTunes store that you find them though, isn't it? It's the app. I don't even know. I think yeah. when you review, you go through po- Apple podcast. I don't know. I don't use it. I use a different. App I don't even store. have any. Apple all, all I know is Apple reviews are yes. very good for people finding us. So when people go, onto the internet and search tabletop podcast the more five star reviews we have in apple reviews the better chance our name shows up absolutely yes, it's self-serving but we would like more people to find us because we must spread our gaming news to the world if you stream on twitch and are interested in a mutual hosting agreement we would love to hear from you we host you you host us and everyone wins just contact mo at tabletopbellhop.com and we can set something up Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Every Wednesday, oops, except today, my bad. Every Wednesday, possibly after our podcast, we will be sending out an email recapping all of the content we've released the week previous. Blog posts, podcast episodes, reviews, and everything else we create. You can my sign- bad. I totally forgot about that today. <laughs> you can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to the tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a subscribe. And you will find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. Wow. I can't believe I completely forgot about the newsletter today. I had spent a lot of time talking to Jeremy at uh, CG Realm today and totally blanked on it. And I was like sitting around going, I got nothing to do until the podcast. (laughs) Terrible. All right. Each episode, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or you can head over to the webpage tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Please send us your questions. We're like the cookie monster, but with questions. Me want questions. Nom, 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 nom. And today's question, over on Google+, Emmett O'Brien asks, 
What are some apps or techniques for playing music and sound effects while GMing? Thanks for the question, Emmett. Also, it was great to meet you at QCC a couple weekends ago. While Emmett is specifically asking about audio when running RPGs, I'm going to expand our answer to include all forms of tabletop gaming. Now, we touched on this very briefly last week on the Episode 7 Tech at the Table episode, but we feel it deserves a deeper dive all on its own. That is correct. So I'm going to start off with a bit of my history with Sound at the Table. Now, when I think way back, I have a few specific instances of sound and gaming that stick out to me that always I always think of. One of them is playing Bolt Thrower on a boombox, on tape, on cassette, while playing Warhammer Fantasy Battle. That, to me, moving my armies across the field, though with how slow Warhammer was back in those days, I probably should have had a waltz or something playing. But Bolt Thrower was what it was, and I'm still shocked that Games Workshop licensed a heavy metal band. That's still kind of cool to me. Then the other one that really sticks out is I used to be a member of the Windsor Gaming Society, which I think we talk about in our episode zero. Local club at the University of Windsor. I was a young kid. They didn't. Some of the people did there didn't want us there. Well, there was a group there that used to set up the most fantastic Star Trek game. They had a blackboard they would put in the middle of the room on one side would be like the view screen and the DM would draw all of it. And then they had all the chairs set up like the bridge crew. And on the other side was an eight by four table. And that's where the AOA team would go as they would go to the other side of the screen. Like that was cool enough. But the other thing they had is they had brought in their boom box and they always played the Star Trek music at the start of it. And like everyone in the room knew, Hey, the Star Trek game starting and it got everyone into the mood. I always thought that was like those two stick to me. So then in quite a few years later, I was running Paranoia and I got this knockoff Casio keyboard for Christmas. And this thing had a sci-fi switch or whatever on it. And man, I brought that to every game session and there was a laser sound and klaxons and alarms. And I used to use that every game and I probably drove everyone else at the club nuts. So it wasn't just because I was a kid that I, they didn't like me. It was, that was annoying too. So more recently, uh, Sean will even remember this game. Because of that original Star Trek experience, and me and Sean, we were kids, we weren't allowed to play, I always wanted to try that system, so I picked up a copy of the FASA Star Trek system. Super old RPG from the 80s, bought it on eBay. And Sean actually came down, at the time he was in Toronto, not Hamilton, and came down to play this Star Trek game. And I used a web-based soundboard. And, of course, I had all the sounds. I had one window open running the engine sound in the background. I had the communicator flipped. I had the phaser sounds and all that. So it, it was a big deal. Now, as for audio for board games, that, I admit, I really got into recently. I personally didn't think board games needed music or sound effects. But I got to admit now, no, I think that it is something that can add to the game night. And again, like all the things tech, it's about balance and level and a level of respect between the host uh, or your GM mm -hmm. and the players. Uh, and the same with any level, any sort of tech at the table, like we talked about last week. Uh, it's got to work for everybody, and there needs to be a discussion about it. Yep, I agree. So I have a long history with it, right? So getting into actual suggestions. So this is what... Uh, what uh, Emmett was looking for. So the biggest thing he wants an RPG answer, we're going to give him his RPG answer right away. The best, and I did some research for this, like possibly more than most of our episodes. I went and downloaded apps. I tried soundboards. I played around with stuff. And before I started that, in my opinion, the best software out there is something called Sirenscape. S-Y-R-I-N Scape. That was my opinion before. That's still my opinion. After trying out a bunch of other ones, this is a fantastic mix of background ambience and music with a soundboard at the same time they have three different themes you can download there's a sci-fi theme a fantasy theme and a board game theme it's on all platforms you can play it on the web you can download a version for windows you can get it for mac you can get it ios you can get it android the uh, background ambiance is fantastic. Like it'll have a list of a bunch of different things and sliders. So you can change sliders for how often the sound happens, how loud the sound is, how often it repeats. What's really impressive are the presets. So for example, I downloaded the sci-fi one and you can just put click drifting in space. And with drifting in space, the engine sounds are loud. The passing ship happens very infrequently. The droid sounds happen now and then. 
The comm beeps happen often. The scanner blips happen every so often. And it just automatically goes through. Now, one of the really impressive things is that Sirenscape guarantees it'll never repeat. So that is something that will bring people out of the immersion of your sound effects. Human nature, you notice repeats, like you notice patterns. We're good at that. It's one of the things humans are fantastic at. If you're looping too quickly, you're going to notice. Well, with Sirenscape, you'll never loop. So you got really cool like background ambiance going on. And then on to the other side, you have buttons. So for the sci-fi one, there was scanner sweep. You click scanner sweep and you get this ping, 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 scanner sweep sound. And then of course, there were the more interesting ones for your RPG, like explosions and phasers. And those are all at the DM's touch of a button. You just hit them and they go off. So you can be sitting there playing with the mixer and you can be hitting all the buttons. Now it includes, it's, it's, you get a handful free, like a, a significant amount, actually, enough to bring to your game night tonight or next weekend. It is well worth trying. You can pay to get it. So there are different packages. So you can like buy all the Sirenscape. It was fairly expensive to get everything. Or you could subscribe, and then you get everything as long as you keep subscribing. Or you could just buy a specific one. So you could go into Sci-Fi and buy the ship travel one. Or you could buy the laser battle one. They really neat one, though, that I had to try out was the board game one. They had chess, which I thought was kind of ridiculous. But then they had one for Catan. And this showed me how cool it could be for Catan, but I think it would be distracting. So they had the preset sound effects. And they had them based on how far you are in the game. So you would start off by your first settlements. And it was just like birds and wind and maybe some animal sounds. And then it's like a few settlements have been formed. And you click that and all of a sudden it would change and you start hearing like an iron smith. And there'd be like people talking in the background. You'd hear carts. And like the last option was lots of cities built. And it sounds like a bustling metropolis all of a sudden. And I'm like, that's pretty cool. So your Catania game, you get that. And then on the side, there were buttons. And there was one for every resource. So if you generated wheat, you would click the wheat button. If you generated coal. And there were sound effects for all this. The thing is, I can't see doing this in the middle of a Catan game. Now, the background audio, yeah, I could see switching between the three, but like every time you roll a six and someone gets wheat and brick, you're going to click buttons. I don't know. It, I thought it was interesting they're trying to do board gaming. Yeah, it sounds good. Now, one thing we should recommend here is we're, we've tried a lot of these. A lot of these have been tried by us, but your specific tabletop setup might be different. So whether we recommend it or not, I recommend you actually download these suggestions that we've gone through and see if it works with your specific setup, yes. your laptop, your your phone, your tablet, the way you like to game. Because one mm -hmm. thing we would you don't want to do is change the way you game and, and the way you're comfortable gaming to fit something like this in. Uh, mm -hmm. You want it to you want it to come in naturally, or you're going to affect the game and. People, the, the, both the GM or the players, may not have as great a uh, experience. So just do be careful when you're introducing new stuff like this. Excellent point. So up next, my next biggest recommendation is uh, a site software. I don't know how you word it. Called Tabletop Audio. It's tabletop one word, audio the other word. This is a very close second to Sirenscape. This one, though, splits the different sound applications that the two different things you can do into two parts so you have a page like i'm thinking of the web page in my head but you can also get an app of just different soundscapes you can choose from and it's all ambiance it's a mix of it like when you mouse over them it tells you if there's music and noises and backgrounds and whatever and the really impressive thing is there's like 160 of them and they add more every day. I noticed today I follow them on G+. They released two new soundscapes today. These are great for putting it on and leaving it. So you go in and, for example, uh, the last time we played Clank in Space, I found one called Alien Machine Shop. And I just went, found Alien Machine Shop, I clicked on it and let it go. And we played Clank in Space. And it was great because Alien Machine Shop just had like weird spacey sounds and then now and then there's to be some blips and bloops but because it was alien every now and then there'd be like a growl in the background which really fit the theme of clank in space this was i find better for board gaming like yes in your rpg there's you know medieval town 
click it or tavern and leave it on. But for board games, this didn't require as much manipulation as Sirenscape. For Sirenscape to really enjoy it, your DM's kind of playing with it on and off, hopefully not too much to ruin the game. But like to get the full effect, you're hitting buttons and stuff. Whereas tabletop audio, hit it, play, go, maybe come back every now and then and change it. The best part, though, is the amount of stuff they have. Like, I should have opened a window so I could list some of them off. Like, it just created. There's, there's steampunk. There's sci-fi. There's underwater. Like, the amount of soundscapes they have is really impressive. Now, the second part of the site is they have now added a sound. So, obviously, they realize Sirenscape's doing something good, and they're trying to do the same thing. This is in beta. Uh, there are a bunch of categories to choose from. I only checked out one called Fantasy Combat because I wanted to see it. There were a ton of sounds, like 90 or so different sounds to choose from. And they were mostly single play, like hit it and grunt. And the guy goes, uh. what was neat is I noticed later that it says grunt two. Well, it ends up, that means there's two possible different grunt sounds. So when you click on it, it randomly selects one. I'm like, that's cool. Like grunt two would be silly. There was like whatever sword swipe six. And there were six different sword swipes. And then some of the sounds were set to loop. So you could do like, there was a battle grunts that would just random uh, 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 that could just play through the whole combat so it had some of the ambiance stuff mixed in with the soundboard very impressive not quite as pretty as sirenscape not quite as easy to use but seems very solid and and unfortunately they've used that word beta and this is a huge pet peeve for me <laughs> it's just if it's beta you don't release it to the public Mm. Making something dirty and calling it beta so that you can excuse the fact that you haven't put a lot of time and effort into designing it nicely. But anyway, that's just my pet peeve. <laughs> Moving on. Fair enough. I did notice Shadzar has joined us in the chat and pointed out that Roll20, which is probably the most popular software for playing RPGs through your computer, right? Through your browser or, well, through their software. So for playing online, has tabletop audio built in. So that's very cool. Uh, good for tabletop audio, getting that license. Yeah. So now moving away from soundboards and non-looped ambiance, let's talk about music or even better soundtracks. So this is not about how it took a while to get into listening to music while we play board games. And music's still a bad example. Uh, so I, I listened to a lot of podcasts and I heard someone talking about how much better Pandemic Legacy was by putting on the soundtrack. And they talked about this like it's something you could go buy. So we're sitting in the Rhetorian Cat playing Pandemic Legacy, and I'm like, wait a minute. We should check that the, the, the soundtrack. And I found it. It's on Spotify. And I can't remember if this one's... There were licensed ones and non-licensed ones, so there's a whole bunch of soundtracks. There was a particular one that was really good. I did not... I did write it down. So it is the Pandemic Legacy Season 1 Playlist by Clyde Wright. C-L-Y-D-E-W-R-I-G-H-T. He released this, and it is so good. Like, it was really interesting tense music that really fit pandemic a lot of it came from the soundtrack to the movie contagion i guess but then there were other ones from night of the living dead and it just it all fit really well with what we were doing now my one thing for spotify is only do it if you have a sub absolutely there's nothing worse than ads to break your mood uh Otherwise, for subscriptions, you also have uh, both Apple Music, Google Play Music, or yep. if you've got your YouTube Red subscription. Um, also, you, like, Spotify is the one that's got these playlists, but uh, if you just yep. want to pick some music and uh, pick a, a channel, uh, some of the other ones are options. I did find some of them on Google Play Music. For some reason, Spotify seemed to be the place to find board game soundtracks. So going on Spotify, what I actually suggest, whatever game you're playing, sit down and Google it or not Google it. Sorry, go on Spotify and search. You'll probably find it. Like we found um, one of my favorites, too, is Wasteland Express Delivery Service, the auto assault soundtrack, which is the best MMO no one's heard of that unfortunately died. Uh, that is great for Wasteland Express. If you're playing a Star Wars game and you don't have John Williams playing, that's not a Star Wars game. The key, though, is make sure this is background music. You want it in the background. You don't want to distract people. I have found personally that lyrics are bad. Any song with lyrics, to me, bring people out. They start listening to the lyrics. They start singing along. They just... This is why I like um, 
movie and TV series soundtracks. From what I hear from the guys at Misdirected Mark especially is that the Avengers and all of the Marvel Cinematic Universe movies are like the best soundtracks for playing board games and RPGs too. I haven't tried it much. I haven't listened to them, but I can totally see it working. Yep. No, that's absolutely true. Uh, words in music trigger so much in people, uh, whether it's whether it's a distraction or a memory or, uh, you know, makes you laugh. Uh, and that and that's just another distraction that we're trying to keep away on uh, from the gable. Uh, the yeah. other thing is, uh, even if you don't, even if you've got a great soundtrack and you're, and you're playing your John Williams, uh, the, the volume level is important. But also, you need to mm. think about your speaker or device placement. Uh, are you using a Bluetooth speaker? Are you just playing it out of, out of your phone? Uh, thinking about your soundscape and the placement of sound and where sound is coming from can make a huge difference. If you've got your phone sitting behind uh, you know, uh, your DM screen... Uh, it's not going to, it's, you're going to get an experience, but you have to also think yeah. about what that experience is going to be for all the other people at the table. If you've got someone down, uh, down at the other end of a four by eight, what's their experience with that same music. So mm -hmm. if you're, if you are planning on doing music, uh, I understand we aren't all going to have sound bars and surround sound systems for it, but yep. just think about where you're playing that music from. Maybe if you've got a bigger table, move around, listen to where that, where it's going to be heard by everyone there. Sounds good. So Sirenscapes and Tabletop Audio, those are my main two. Like, while researching to answer this, I looked at a lot more. Uh, what amused me is I must have found 10 different top X ways to enhance your game night, top blah, blah, blahs. And on every single one was Sirenscape and Tabletop Audio. So if you read a lot of blogs, maybe I'm not telling you anything. I was happy to say, hey, I'm right. I don't know. Made me feel good. Kept seeing the same stuff. So. Here's some other ones I did find you may want to check out. So the best app I found was called RPG Sounds. RPG Sounds, like space sounds, colon fantasy. Which I thought was odd because there was no RPG Sounds sci-fi or RPG Sounds monsters. There was just RPG Sounds fantasy. This did music, ambiance, soundboard. It kind of did everything. Not quite as fancy as the, the big two, but cool enough. Uh, the thing is, it sounded very video gamey. It had mm -hmm. that digital, they didn't sound like real grunts and groans. They sound, or like the dragon roar sounded like something out of Ultima, right? Like it just, it, it, it was neat. I don't know. Like I have a feeling if I was playing my game, especially if I was trying to do a serious RPG, it might bring me out of it because it would make me start thinking video games. Yeah. If you're playing something a little more on the eight bit side, uh, you know, on the eight bit yeah. side, great. But you know. they, maybe it's the perfect game for you guys that hate fourth edition D and D because it's a it's an MMO, not a board, not a role playing game. You can play it with this. So another one I found was RPG Sound, which was one word, and when you search it, it's RPG Sound bracket RPG Soundboard. Now all these should be in the show notes once this releases. I did talk about most of these, not necessarily all of them on the blog as well. This was very bare bones. It was just a soundboard. No ambiance, no music, just, you know, tap the button to make sounds. It was good, though. Like, they were good sounds. And another option is you can actually build your own. Now, if you're really dedicated and, you know, if you're, if you're you know, the question initially was about RPGs. And so if you're, if you're building a campaign, you may want your own custom soundscape. And in that case, there's actually a lot of other options. I would start with... Getting a, a background music and, and a lot of these uh, sort a lot of these options are great for just your background theme and then build your own soundboard. And you know, it's just as simple as having a little sound player app and a bunch of sound files that are labeled for your use where you can double click or tap on them real quickly. Mm -hmm. uh, and there's because there's a lot of options out there for downloading sound effects that where you don't have to have the whole soundboard and, and deal with their their limited selection. Mm-hmm. And speaking of which, one of the sites I found was soundboard.com. This is basically what Sean's talking about, being able to find this stuff. This had lots of ads everywhere. It was an ugly site, uh, but they had a ton of sound effects, like over 500,000 sound bites. And they had them so you could like hit the play button, but it wasn't really a soundboard. You could download them all, which was really cool. Now, 
almost all these sounds were from licensed properties. So it was sound effects from Star Trek, the TV series, from Star Wars, from X-Files. I happened to be looking at sci-fi ones at the time. What I worry about, so this is use at your own re risk, is I'm not sure how they legally got the rights to all these sounds, and I'm really guessing they did not. So this is this is actually interesting, and, and I have a former life as a photographer, and I've, I've spent a lot of time on copyright in my time. Realistically, there's absolutely nothing wrong with a personal, private game using whatever sound effects you want. Nothing at okay. all. Uh, the key is, don't stream it, don't record it, <laughs> don't play it in a public place. If you're okay. in, if you're in a pr your own private uh, house, you can pretty much use anything you want. The problem is distributing or public use. And that's okay. where that's where the big thing comes in. So as long so, as you're staying away from those from from public use or uh, actual record distribute distributing in any way, you're safe. You're you're all golden. See, that's why I wonder if this site's even legal though, because they're obviously distributing these sounds. They are, but they can get away with personal use sort of things. So okay, they can get in trouble. I'm not saying they can't get in trouble and get shut <laughs> right, down. Right, you're safe as long as you're not distributing. So and that's actually no. that's actually one of the problems with torrents. Downloading in Canada, at least, it's a little different elsewhere. But in Canada, for instance, downloading a torrent isn't actually illegal. Resharing it once you've downloaded mm -hmm. is illegal. Um, so if you just suck down the torrent and don't ever send it to anyone else, which isn't really how torrents work, if you uh, well, yeah, that's you're, kind you're of fine. the point of a torrent. <laughs> but uh, but it's it's the actual sharing it out again that becomes illegal. Um, but yeah, if you're just using sound effects for your own personal uh, and you're not putting it on YouTube or, or Twitch or anything else, go ahead, use whatever you want. The FBI can't come knocking on your door. There you go. And now you know. <laughs> so another one I found, this is another large web database, kind of like soundboard.com. It's ambient hyphen mixer, ambient mixer. This uh, was background music, pure background music uh it had there are apps for it what was impressive on here is i found a large rpg session section a large rpg section with fantasy sci-fi and stuff like that now this is a fan driven site this is a site where people who have made their own ambient music upload it everyone on the site rates them one to five you can look at the hot ones of the day actually pretty cool site if you want like sean said that's just that background noise now, the one problem I found with this is 99% of what you're going to find is going to loop. So you need to find either multiple files or you need to find ones that are long enough that you're not going to notice it. Another interesting one I found was called Battle Bards. This does what tabletop audio does, but is very low tech. Like board game arena looks fancy compared to this site. I have a feeling it was all made in Visual Basic. It looks like a fan project. But that said, it looks very powerful. There are a lot of mixer options, potentially even there's a programming language. Like I spent a few minutes on this site, well, more than a few minutes, probably about half an hour. And it looks to have a rather large learning curve. They have software you can download. I did download it. I then tried to create my own soundboard. And that's when I noticed that absolutely everything has to be paid for. Each individual sound, each individual background, all cost money. Every track you want to use, you have to pay before you can put it in your own mixer or do anything with. Now, I wasn't going to pay to find out how good this was. Sorry. Like, I love you guys, but I wasn't going to spend money on this Battle Bards thing. If someone out there has used it, please let us know. Now, the samples on the site were all watermarked. So it starts as it starts playing. It's like BattleBards.com, right? Right in the middle of the audio. So you're not going to be using this on your table. But what I heard sounded pretty good. So it wasn't very digital. The sound effects sounded cool. The background music sounded cool. I think I listened to a spooky forest one. Sounded good, except it said BattleBards.com over top of what I was listening to. So this may be worth checking out. It seems it's probably for the DIY fan, someone who wants to maybe not necessarily reinvent the wheel and build a whole soundboard themselves, but for, for uh, someone who wants to deep dive into like balancing levels and you know, the kind of stuff podcasters do. The one thing I just, I just took a quick look at the site and the first thing that comes to mind when I look at that, if you are live streaming your role-playing sessions, I think this looks like a fantastic idea yeah. because the fact that you're paying for this stuff means, and I didn't check the terms of use, true. but it's almost certain uh, 
I'm not a lawyer. I don't, I don't play one on TV, but it looks a lot like you're okay to broadcast this and record this stuff. So cool. I think if you're a streamer looking to set up an RPG and have your sound effects and everything, I would definitely check this out. Stay above board, stay legit, and it is a powerful system. So I think uh, if yeah, you're if you're like already it. sitting down in front of a, a computer to do streaming, you're probably going to have a good time setting this up to uh, to do the audio the way you want. Yeah, it looked impressive. It just looked like more than I was willing to try to figure out. <laughs> Absolutely. So while doing the research, uh, Angie Games joined me in the room and was like, "What are you looking up?" And then she's like, "Oh, have you seen Coffitivity?" I think I'm saying that right. It's C O F F I T I V I T P Y. Holy cow. Give me a second here while I get the air or something out of me. <clears throat> so she suggested coffitivity, C O F F I T I V I T Y. Now, I guess this is like a hugely popular thing that's all over all like the news sites that this is the thing you do now if you're like a writer or you're a CEO or you're a business person. And what it is, is while you're working, you put this on and it makes it sound like you're in a coffee shop. I guess this is a thing that people do. I don't know. Whatever. The neat part, though, is Coffee City has all kinds of different coffee shops and bistro soundscapes, which actually could be really cool for a modern RPG. Or... Used as intended, if you're a game designer or prepping an RPG, you can make it sound like you're sitting in the second cup at home. Now, a similar site is Noisly, N-O-I-S-L-I. This is the same deal. Like, it's supposed to be this thing that that uh, powerful people, high-performance people use. It creates soundscapes for you to concentrate and work better. But it's got some really cool lists of things that are more than just coffee shops, mostly modern, but there's all kinds of like meditation sounds and rain and all kinds of cool soundscapes. Again, I think there's probably some really good ones in there for gaming and the quality is top notch. Now, after looking at those two, I started deep diving into this whole make soundscapes to make yourself productive. And I found a site called my noise, my N O I S E one word. This was another productivity site. But it seems the gamers got in there because there are some really good fantasy RPG style soundscapes there. I particularly liked one called Dark World. What I liked about this is it had a bit of sirenscape there where there were eight or so sliders for different sounds and you could drag them again and change how often they were happening or how loud or frequent they were. Now, these weren't nearly as complex as the sirenscape ones, but still really nice. And these were like movie soundtrack level. Like they were good sounds. It didn't sound like I was listening to a video game. I have to say, I just, I actually just bookmark noisily. That, that's yeah, interesting. It's... And because I've got my, my, I'm stuck in my home office uh, so much of the time, uh, I'm interested in, in giving that one a test myself. There you go. Next week, Sean will tell you if positivity <laughs> and noisily actually did improve his productivity. There we go. If the, if the podcast comes out on time, we're halfway there. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. Yeah, I have to put you in charge of the newsletter, obviously. <laughs> I still got an hour, so I might be able to get it out on Wednesday. There we go. I didn't say which time zone, so I think I'm still safe. So that's a lot of different apps. Now, I'm still going to fall back on my big three. Sirenscapes for mixing ambience and soundboards together. I love that for RPGs. It's something I actually plan on after doing this research using more often or again, because I kind of moved away from it. I'm seriously considering um, either a pay once or a subscription or at least getting a couple different ones. Now, tabletop audio is what I'm going to use when I want uh, unique sounds, like if I'm running cyberpunk or I'm running, I, uh, not sci-fi, like the punk or underwater mermaid adventures, I could probably find a really cool underwater soundtrack. I'm probably going to use tabletop audio. And I'm going to use tabletop audio some, for some board games because it has some really neat just ambient sound effects. And, oh, Cthulhu stuff. Oh, my God. There are so many awesome mythos haunted house things. Like if the Mansions, for, Mansions of Madness app didn't already have background sounds, tabletop audio has got you covered. And then when that fails, when I can't find the right soundboard for either, that's when I'm going to grab Spotify and I'm going to look up whatever game I'm going to play. And there's a really good chance I'm going to find that game there. So just as a kind of a summary, uh, make sure your whole group is on board with this. Yeah. Uh, make sure that everyone, that no one has any hearing problems and that you're not going to be uh, making it too difficult for someone else to hear by adding in background noise. Uh, it's just an issue. Avoid your lyrics and uh, 
don't overwhelm anyone. Uh, the game itself. This is bad. This should be music to be part of the game, not over mm-hmm. top of the game. Exactly. So I'm still pretty new to adding audio to my game nights. Yes, I listened to Bolt Thrower a long time ago with uh, with Warhammer, but I mean, like, using it, taking it more seriously. I love it, but I haven't tried everything that's out there, as I'm sure this may be obvious in this episode. If you know of a great website or app for increasing the intensity and immersion at your table, let us know. Either contact me on social media, where we can be found as Tabletop Bellhop, one word, pretty much everywhere. Or write mo at tabletopbellhop.com. We'll be sure to include your recommendations in a future episode. Well, well, this was a great talk. But if you'd like to read more on this topic, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you will see this and other questions answered in blog form. Be sure to send us your questions over on the website under Ask the Bellhop. Or email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Patreon patrons at the good tip or better level get their questions bumped to the top of the question list and get answered quicker. Speaking of our Patreon, a shout out and a thank you to our backers. Graham Barnett, thanks. Brian Kurtz, thank you. Joe Swick, awesome, man. One more shameless plug. For links to the best online deals on tabletop games, check out at tabletop underscore deals on Twitter. Also, be sure to check out our brother podcast, The Misdirected Mark, where Chris, Phil, and Bob talk gaming and game mastering every week. Well, that was the double bell. That means my shift is coming to an end and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the front doors, yeah. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to support our efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night, 9.30 p.m. Eastern, and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday morning. Well, that about wraps the time we have here for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us and hang around in the penthouse suite for an off-the-books, unless you're a patron, after show. <laughs> for Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on. Game <laughs> on.